Okay, great. Now let's start to move on to the topic of optical interference in this lab. By the time you're done with this lecture today, you should have a pretty good understanding why you get these different colors on this soap bubble, including the gradual coloration here and the streaks you see here. So we'll cover that and some topics we're going to explore in the lab as well. So today we're going to mainly use wave optics to understand thin film interference. Okay, so we're going to interpret things in this way not ray optics. And the topics we're going to cover include the basic principles of interference. We're going to revisit refraction as interference. We're going to look at interferometers. We'll talk about thin film interference and anti-reflection coatings on lenses. And we'll talk about Bragg reflectors, dielectric materials, and some advanced stuff and applications. So, a brief review of, uh, of photons and waves. As we discussed uh, in the first week, you could freeze a photon in time and then observe it with respect to distance. So that'd be the kx term in the wave equation here. Okay, And of course, you can't see the animated GIFs here, but I gave you the link for it. You could also freeze it in position and then observe it with time, omega t, as it oscillates and moves through the position. So you've, if you've frozen your position, you could see the E field oscillating and the magnetic field oscillating. And of course, remember that the units in here are radians. Uh, by convention. That'll be important today as we talk about introducing phase into this equation as well. Last thing I want to note is that we could also, instead of drawing the whole photon, just track the E field, so just the E field component, not the magnetic field. And furthermore, for the E field, just show the peak as plane waves. And so when you looked at those, pre those uh, on the previous slide where we looked at the, pl the wave interpretation of this, all you're doing is either drawing straight lines or rectangles or something like this, where you're just tracking the peak amplitude of the E field. So this means every 360 degrees or 2 pi where it comes back to its peak value positive there. So what we can then do is say, let's say I have two waves here. So here's the first wave. Here's the second wave. And I start them out, and I could try to interfere them together by overlapping them. Now, in this case, my peaks of my E fields, the zero points and the troughs, all line up. So this is, would be constructive interference of two waves. For example, this would be the laser beam has multiple photons in it, and they're all in phase, and so the laser beam is this situation. So if you look at the resulting um, you look at the resulting intensity, it will be greater because these are constructively interfering. Now, let's look at destructive interference. Here I've got my two waves here, and now you can see that the, the peaks for this wave are here, whereas the peaks for this wave are here. They're exactly out of phase, right? And so what happens, if you try to observe this, you will see no E-field intensity at all. So the question is, well, do we just, does this just kill the light? Well, as you're going to learn today, and you'll learn when we do diffraction gratings, no, you don't actually kill the light. What, by the principle of interference, simply this means that the light can't be here and it has to show up somewhere else. And you'll see that more and more in this course. So it's important that you understand when we talk about destructive interference of two waves that are based on light, that it doesn't just kill the energy, because you can't just kill energy. Conservation of energy doesn't allow you to do that, right? It has to go somewhere. So what it does is it moves it to somewhere else where then it can show up. But we'll see more of that later, as I mentioned. So let's look at this interference in greater detail. And so the previous slide showed perfect in phase or perfect out of phase, meaning 180 degree by, uh, phase shift, where the phase is given by P. Okay? And so if this is basically, what if I had two plane waves and I started the second one a, at, a, at a phase delay phi after the first? So how do we account for this phase in the wave equation for the second wave here? Well, I'll take the same E field equation here, all the same terms, but all I'm going to do is add the phase here in radians. So if I started with the delay of phi, then I'll add phi into the wave equation here, which was all I needed at that point. So the question is, is if I want to try to, to add these two waves up, what if I have cases where I'm not perfect in phase or out of phase, 
And how do I tell, even if I am in perfect in phase, how do I tell how to add up the, the peak amplitudes? Do we just add the sum of the E fields, for example? Is it just simple addition? Well, it's not. And how we typically measure the interference is in terms of intensity. And intensity for a, for a, a, a beam of light would be speed of light, refractive index, permittivity of free space, divided by 2, times the square of the E field. And intensity is units of watts per meter squared. Okay, so that's how many how much energy per unit time, per unit area, for example, would be hitting a surface. How intense is it on the surface? What we can do is we can feed this into the interference equation, the wave equation, into here, okay, for two waves, each of intensity I1 and I2. So let's say the first wave has I1 intensity, the second wave has I2 intensity. Well, what we get at the end is that our resulting intensity with interference can be calculated as follows first intensity, second intensity, two times the square root of the product of the intensities, and then cosine of the phase difference, phi, between the two waves. So here's some examples. If you do 360 degrees and you put it in there, 2 pi, then you'll find that everything's in phase, and your resulting amplitude is 16. You start with 4 and 4 for each of these and you get 16. Notice that that's more than double what you would expect if you just added them. If you just added them it would be 8. We'll come back to that in a second. If I'm perfectly out of phase, pi, then you'll see when you add this all up this becomes a negative term, subtracts from here and you get 0. Then you can do things where you're not neither perfect in phase or out of phase. 60 degrees, you can see you get 8 for this. 120 degrees, you get 4. Here's an interesting one. Do a photon or a ray or whatever you have that has a intensity of 2 and an intensity of 8. And then make them in phase. You get 18, not 10. Again, it doesn't add. More interesting, do that same 2 and 8 and make them perfectly out of phase. Do you get 0? No, you don't. Because if you're going to make them perfectly out of phase and have them cancel out, you would also need them to have the same starting amplitude. Because if the amplitudes are different, the weaker wave doesn't have enough amplitude to completely cancel out the stronger wave. So you're wondering, you know, you look at this first one here, like I started with an intensity of 4, intensity of 4, and I see a peak intensity of 16. How do I get that? Well, the key is that this is measuring the peak intensity, okay, not the averaged, averaged uh, total energy or, or power of the system. So if the two beams are of equal intensity, the maxima is four times as bright as the individual beams. So if individual beams were four, the maxima is 16. That would be the peaks, okay? But if you integrate the whole thing across here, if you integrate the total brightness across here, you get the same average power, average brightness. So you're actually seeing that the peaks go up, but the spaces in between actually dips down more. And so you don't actually see a, a magical increase in energy or anything like that. I also want to note that we're going to use interference in this course to predict all sorts of things. And we last week we used basically refraction and ray optics and some trigonometry to predict Snell's law, right, and refraction. And so when I'm going from a low refractive indexing medium to a high refractive indexing, my incidence angle turns into a refracted angle, which is smaller because n2 is greater than n1. But we could, you know, we could also use wave optics and interference to predict the same thing. Interference puts a requirement on light that it has to go where it is going to be constructively interfering. So the plane waves must stay in phase and if you look at light coming through air onto a glass surface here which has a higher refractive index, we know what happens is that as light travels into the glass it travels slower, right? because the speed of light inside of medium refractive index n is the speed of light divided by the refractive index n. We also know that in a certain period, a uh, certain refractive index, that the wavelength of light in the refractive index is equal to wavelength of light in free space divided by the refractive index. And so my wavelength is decreasing by the refractive index here as well, and so my Peaks and my peaks and valleys become closer together. Well, what happens is if I'm going to have everything stay in phase. Notice how everything's perfectly in phase for these plane waves. 
In the glass, it wants to stay perfectly in phase. Well, look what happened here as I went from here, and then it first reaches the glass here. While this is being slowed down, so this is moving fast out here because it's in air, and then this is being slowed down here by the refractive index, the only way that this system can stay in phase is for it to bend such that when the other part of the plane wave finally reaches the glass and gets in there, it can stay in phase. And so if it bends like this, by the time the component over here of the plane wave hits the glass and then bends, it'll be able to enter so that they're all in phase. So the reason it bends, again, is that so you can stay in phase, as you can see here. Again, interference commands the light where it must go. And we'll see that over and over again in this course. So at this point, take a break and uh, make sure, again, you're solid on these type of, of questions because they can show up on the quiz.